Um, I'm going to mute everyone. Where is everybody? Dr. Young, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Dr. McNicholas, you both have to unmute yourselves. I've muted everyone. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, is everybody here? Yep. All right. Well, well, huh? Welcome back. Hopefully everything's been going um, well for you so far and you're learning some things. I've been operating all morning, so I had to rush over here to catch up with you all. Hope it's going well. So what we're going to do is have an x-ray workshop. It gets a, in the past, we would ha I would have um, students grab x-rays and come up and, and look at um, the skeleton and so forth and try to point out um, where these abnormalities may have been. So we'll do our best with this. Um, uh, Miss uh, McNicholas is going to use the chat box to try to um, keep control of questions and so forth as they come in. I probably won't be able to answer everybody's, but if we get a good smattering of um, questions, then we'll go from there. And I think about 45 minutes or so, we'll, we'll give folks a break unless you just want to keep driving on through this. All right. Questions at this point before I start. I guess not. All right, let me try to share this screen, see if it works. All right. I don't know. Did it work? So I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, we can, we can see it now. We can see it. I'm trying to get everything big enough. All right. This is still weird for me. I'm old. I'm not used to all this stuff. All right, so you can see it. All right. So what are the objectives of all of this? We're gonna compare and contrast normal x-ray findings with abnormal examples and discuss these things. So obviously I know that the vast majority of you will not have seen a lot of these conditions, but that's okay. I want you to do your best to think about it and um, we'll go from there and hopefully you'll learn a little bit about different x-rays that, that are available to medicine. As you can imagine, um, it, clinical medicine, um, PT, ophthalmology, optometry, all of that can use, and especially dentistry can use x-rays in order to look at um, different parts of the body, try to figure out what's going on or the different modalities um, that can be used. They're plain x-rays where they shoot um, um, high particle beams through patients. Um, does anybody know? I, have you all seen x-rays before? Let me ask that first. Yeah? Okay, fine. So when you shoot x-rays through, through a person, um, the bones show white. That's because there's calcium in those bones. So those high particle x-rays get absorbed by the bone and it turns white. If you shoot x-rays through air, then it's black. And that's why if you take a chest x-ray, you'll see the ribs, which would turn white, but the air behind them will be black. So where you see um, the white is where it's basically a negative where the high x-ray particles have been stopped. CT scans are, are different and we have a couple of CT examples of that. So um, basic human anatomy. I don't know if all of you have had anatomy or not. Um, if you have another window or have a book, it may be worthwhile to just have a, a book there since I got a, in the past, I would have a skeleton up front, but at least, you know, if you have something, you can open up to look at a skeleton somewhere else. But you can see all the different bones um, from the head down to the chest, arms, pelvis, and so forth, all the basic things. All right. So this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to put up x-rays. I want you guys to think about what it may be and also think about what may have happened to cause these problems. And you can put it in the um, chat box and then someone can give their thoughts as to what these things are. We've got broken bones, we've got fractures, more fract, well, fracture with a query, clean break, fracture. Where are they? Fracture. Well, what's your like, guess as to where they are? Tibia and fibula. Right. Looks like a broken tibia, fibula, knee, leg, tibia, fibula, tibia, tib, fib. All right. So, so this is not uncommon. It takes a lot of force to break a bone. Okay. Even more with a femur. 
So these poor folks have had both of these bones broken with a lot of force. Car accidents can do it, falls can do it, but usually it's a tangential force to the bone. And bone has different components. And there's an outer portion of the bone that's much more dense. Inside the bone is where you have the bone marrow. And inside that bone marrow, it's um, more open. And that bone marrow also produces um, uh, the white blood cells of your, of your body. And so the bones are hollow. And so it's not uncommon for them to be able to be broken like this. So these are compound fractions of the tibia and fibula. fibula. And if you look, um, there's all different types um, of them. They can have multiple different combinations uh, of, of these types of breaks. And in order to repair them, and I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, I'm a transplant surgeon, so don't ask me if, what type of plates these are because I couldn't tell you. But what they do is basically orthopedic docs are, are like carpenters, basically. So they go in and they try to move bones around and they use screws. If you look at the first, first um, um, x-ray, you can see on the tibia down by the ankle, you see those screws? They're, they're, they're screw screws but they're medical screws. So they, they basically find one part of the bone and drive the, 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 the nail, uh, the screw through it to connect them. And then you also see these plates, these long um, plates, and then they put screws through that in order to subsequently hold the bone in place. So, so it doesn't move until it heals. And they have lots of different um, ways to do that. Um, but this is, this is typical. Obviously you can imagine the amount of pain that, that this can occur, that it hurts a lot because there's something called a periosteum. And that runs along the outside of the bone and that's where all the nerves are. And it also helps the bones to regenerate. And so one of, what's one of the big things you need um, to help regenerate the bone? So we've actually in the chat, um, yeah. we've got the uh, fibula in Spanish and I'm not gonna, I do not speak Spanish and I don't wanna destroy the name. So, John Louis, would you like to <laughs> pronounce that for us? Perone, perone. Perone, okay. I didn't want to I didn't want to mutilate it, so well I'm pretty bad too. I lost <laughs> the, I lost my language center long ago. I can't I'm 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 I do I do have my duolingo. I'm trying to learn Spanish. I'm I'm so bad. My 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 son is really good at it. He what did advance, he has a minor in it. I, I don't even know what he says. All right, so um you need calcium. The calcium, the same thing that absorbs um, the x-rays is what you need to rebuild the bone. And I, I don't know if you've heard of um, osteoporosis, osteopenia. Osteopenia is a lack of something. So osteopenia is where there's a decreased amount of bone. And then if you get it really bad, then it's osteoporosis. And this usually occurs in elderly women, but it can happen in men as well, where their bones get very thin and they get very brittle and they can fracture. And you can imagine that some of these folks would need uh, physical therapy after, we're, after all this is healed. All right, where are we now? We have fractures, I know you know that, but where are we now? In the radius. So where are we? What part of the body? Someone said radius, Dr. Young. The wrist, forearm. Yeah, the wrist and the forearm, that's correct. So you have the radius is the bigger, but if you look at the middle panel where it says radius and you have ulna, there's a break in the radius there. Then you have all those little bones in, in the wrist. That allows the wrist to have all this flexibility. And then you have the carpal bones of the hands there. Again, all these fractures can occur different places, falling down, roller skating, um, playing a sport, you just fall down the wrong way and you can go and snap the bone. Um, the panel all the way on the left is more like a green stick fracture. That's where it's been twisted. And so they get this little bitty fracture. Sometimes you don't see a whole lot, but it can hurt a lot. But that's because they, um, because of that periosteum being so inflamed and all. So here are all the disc, uh, the wrist carpal bones. Yeah, I think one, yeah. um, there's a question in the chat. What's the difference between a fracture bone and a broken bone? Same thing. Fracture is just the, I guess, the more the medical term versus broken, same thing. And there's different parts. So that first, the third panel 
it goes a part way through. It's not all the way through. Whereas the other panel on the first one in the middle, it shows a complete separation of the two pieces. Obviously, if they're fractured, then they're, they're going to be unstable and it's going to hurt. So um, fracture and broken bones are the same. So here's the wrist bones. You can see there's seven, one, two, three, four, five. So yeah, seven, roughly seven, eight. It's been a long time since I thought about a wrist. But even these little bones can fracture too, and they're hard to heal because even though the hand looks like it has good blood supply, these little bones can be hard to heal at times. And there are lots of different types of fractures. Um, there's normal anatomy and all different types. Um, the, 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 that we really don't have to worry about. But it's all, all of this re, um, uh, requires a force against it to break the bone. And so repair wrist fractures again. They have these funky plates that they put on, if you look at the first panel, with screws. But you gotta let the body heal. Now sometimes these, these plates can get infected and the bones can, and the screws can get, and that's a mess. Because you can have, sometimes these bones may not heal completely, have something called a non-union, and that can be a big problem. Um, and obviously, the, the, the casts are at the bottom to try to immobilize the joint in order for it to heal um, over time. So th those are simple fractures. You know, you fix it, you set it, then you let the body go and heal it. But it doesn't always do that if, if the patient has poor nutrition. They, they may not heal very well. And a lot of times, has anybody ever had a broken bone? Yeah. Uh, there's a question coming in. How do the plates get infected? Um, because it's a foreign body. Sometimes they can get infected if, if they have a, a site somewhere else and the bacteria travels around and it gets into the, into the, um, um, in the area that it's repaired. It can infect it that way. Most of the times these don't, these type, but they sometimes can um, get infected. Uh, but also if there's, the other thing that can happen is it, if the fracture occurs with an open wound too. So sometimes you can have something called a comminuted fracture where it breaks and it breaks through this muscle, breaks through the skin, and then it can get dirty. Okay, even though they clean the wound up and repair it, those wounds are much more likely to get infected and not heal properly because the bacteria gets in there. So they have to give antibiotics to try to heal it. Has anyone had a cast before? We've got lots of broken bones in the chat. Goodness, what are you people Elbows doing to break up? What is wrong with you people? Elbows uh, and uh, oh my else. Gosh. same guys, bone twice. <laughs> are you guys like in the MMA or something? Radius. Gracious. <laughs> All right, well, after you had your broken bone, what did, what did your arm or leg look like? What did the muscles look like? What did your skin look like? Was it the Fallen, same? shrunken, skinny. Yeah, why? Why do you think? Tight, slinky, scaly skin, ashy, yeah. purple, so no why? use. Why do you think? Flopping around? Ooh, that sounds atrophic. Is it because they're <laughs> not moving yeah. as often? It atrophied, why? Because you weren't using it, yeah. right? So the, so the skin got dry, didn't have the sun, so it lost its moisture, so it dried out, and you end up looking like a fish. Whereas the muscle gets contracted because you're not using it, it atrophies. So that's why, especially for the physical therapy folks, you gotta keep your patients moving because you don't want them to atrophy. You gotta get them up and moving and doing all their exercises in order to strengthen them because their muscles will get weak. If your muscles get weak, then you can't move your limbs, right? So, and then also you, you guys work on tendons as well and strengthening the muscles that are connected to the tendon. Oh, does anybody know how a rack works? The medieval racks? I know this is off subject, but that's the way my mind works. Anybody know what a medieval rack is? I can't pull a picture of it. Huh, the rack? Oh my gosh, you guys oh. don't know what the rack is? The rack. Dr. Rissier's on the, uh, huh? Dr. Rissier's joined us. Oh, that's all good. Okay, so in the middle. He has to answer the <laughs> yes. got to answer. So, many, Hold on, Dr. Young. One of the students said yes. Alex Matthews says all he right, knows. what is it? What's a rack? 
you get strapped Basically. in with your wrists and your ankles and you there's a big wheel that's turned yeah. and they stretch you to the point of nearly dislocating your upper and lower extremities. Yeah, I always thought that the that the bones would break, but actually the tendons snap. It's supposed to, to be point. unpleasant. Yeah, very, very bad. But you yeah. guys, it's a very bad medieval portrait. All right. So that that that's that's all subject. All right. So where are we now and what part what part of the body do you think that is? And look, look, look to see where the problem is. Where do you think that is? It's kind of obvious, but what part Ma of the body? Mandible, the mandible. We've got jaw, we've got skull. You. All right, so this, these, these are mandibular fractures. So that takes a lot of energy to break a jaw. And you can look in the first one that that fracture going right through that that last molar look at that oh that's painful the middle one has the same thing you see how the jaw is offset and moved over and then the third picture is a head-on um i guess a panoramic uh, view and you see the fracture down here going about five o'clock and the mandible that hurts but trying to repair these can be um interesting because you got to stop the mandible from moving and so there are lots of different types of fractures where they occur. But one of the things for the dentist, you got to watch out if you're dealing with a mandibular fracture because you can, it can affect the teeth. It can affect the nerves of the teeth because it can go down through the nerve root, break the bone where the nerve is running. So you got to watch that. Other, other fractures up near the joint here can completely destabilize the jaw. And you can't close it, or they can, and they can get locked in place where they can't open their mouth. So there's there's certain areas that are more prone than before, and they show the percentages of the mandibular fracture. So trying to fix these things almost looks like something out of horror horror story. But again, they use plates, they use screws and plates, and all these funky things. Look at that thing. Look look at the uh, the one in the middle. I don't know how they do that, but the only way they can eat is to drink liquids. Oftentimes, these folks lose a lot of weight, but they end up having to drink a liquid diet because they can't move their jaw. Why do you think they have to keep the jaw immobile? Why do, why do they go through all of this? Any is thoughts? Why do they go through all this? Hmm? Any thoughts? Is it so that it can be reconstructed? That's part of it. What else? So let's let's say you have a big fracture somewhere. Your jaw is broken and it's sitting all out of whack. Now think about think back to the to the leg and the all and the wrist. What do they do there? Why why put those plates there? Aside from putting the bones back together, they also did what to those areas? We've got comments in the chat. It it up, so it's like a cast for the... Right, they put a cast, and the cast does what? Immobilizes it. It immobilizes it. It yeah. stops it from moving, too. Because same thing here. This is a, a sort of like a cast where they can't open their jaw. If you open it and move it, even though it's plated, the, the, those bones are still loose. And if you keep moving it, they won't join. So you have to keep them in close proximity so that periosteum and the new bone can come across and then knit together enough to stabilize it. So it's not only to put the plates in, but you also have to immobilize it to give it time to, to seal and to, and, and to heal. Because otherwise, if you keep moving it, even though you plated it, it'll, it'll break again. And you can even break the plates. So, I have a question. Uh, a yeah, sure. question uh, do mandible fractures get treated by an orthopedic or a dental surgeon? That's a good question. Usually it's a dental surgeon. Well, actually, actually, there's something called oral maxillofacial surgeon. I know that's a lie. But a what the, too. Huh? A lot of training, too. Oh, yeah. Everything is. Well, don't, wouldn't you want somebody to train real well if they put that in your mouth? You better know what you're doing. That, that thing is, looks horrible. You better know what you're doing. So an oral maxillofacial surgeon, um, they're dentists, but then they go for extra probably two, three years at least 
to, to work on facial fractures. Um, jaws, facial, there's something called a fort fracture, the people's part of the front of their face is broken. Nose can come dislocated, all zygomatic arch, and they go in, peel the face back sometimes, and reconstruct all that stuff. But it's, but it's they're the ones who do, it's really slick what they do. Those, those, those folks are really neat. And it's really neat what they do. They also do a lot with children. With, pe with children who have mid-facial deformities, they can actually, if the face is sunken in, they can pull the face out to make it more normal. So it's really neat uh, what they do. So those are oral maxillofacial surgeons. So those are the ones that do this, not orthopedics, but orthopedics do, do the long bones, the hips and all of that. But this is the oral maxillofacial. And they're, re they're really neat if that's something that, that you can look behind beyond. There, there's also um, um, DDS, doctors of dental surgery. They do a little bit more. Um, um, with, with dentistry, they do uh, the, the root canals. Um, they'll do wisdom teeth more. They'll do a little bit more. They'll do a lot more than what, what general dentists do. So there, there are lots of things. Even in dentistry, there's subsets of that which require more training to do. So there's always more to do. So we have another question. Yeah, how, sure. how long does the injury take to heal? And another question, um, can the oral and maxi maxillofacial surgeon okay. heal as a plastic surgeon? Okay. So for healing, these things probably take six to eight weeks, maybe longer than that, depending, again, on the nutrition and the health of the um, subject. Let's say if you have a 20-year-old with a broken jaw, they're going to heal a lot better than a 60 or 7 year old, 70 year old. Okay? So what they'll do as they go along is get x-rays to see if it's healing. So they can x-ray through a cast and look at the fracture see if it's going away. So you may have a plastic surgeon involved. The plastic surgeon by and large is not going to do this. But if you have a bad accident like someone um, has an accident and they didn't wear their seat belt and they go through the windshield and they don't die, then not only could they have fractures, but they, they can also have a lot of cuts, split lip or whatever else. So it's not uncommon for that oral maxillofacial to work with a plastic surgeon to, do, to reconstruct that patient. So the oral maxillofacial will take care of the broken bones and all that, but the plastic surgeon will go by and do all the cosmetic stuff to try to make it as normal as possible. Okay. Next. Um, All right. another, another comment. Another. Um, okay, go back. I wonder if you drink a lot of milk, would it heal faster? Well, if mm -hmm. you're lactose intolerant, then you got a problem. <laughs> but um, it probably doesn't hurt. I don't. I don't know if you have to or not. But um, but yeah, if your vitamin D levels are low and your calcium levels are low, then it's going to be harder to heal. But again, they're gonna they're gonna drink high power shakes through this. This is not fun because they just have to sip through it that's just that's just, that's just bad so don't don't get that but um yeah getting getting extra supplements may be necessary so what type of x-rays are these called they're different than the other ones we've got some answers and okay. where are we where are we uh cts cat yeah. scans cat, more cat scans all right, this is not grabbing a cat and moving it over somebody. It, it, CAT scan stands for computer, com, com, computer axle tomography, something like that. But there's a different type of x-ray that allows us to see soft tissue, okay? Rather than, they see bones too, but also see the soft tissue. So if you look at the first panel, if you look over at, um, uh, for you all, I guess that'll be the nine o'clock position. That's the liver, that big structure there. And then you can see the ribs, those white, those five white dots on the left are the ribs, are the rib cage. Then it's the liver. And, and then the, the, the lighter portion. I'm like, can you see my, 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 um, mm -hmm. yeah. my, my thing? Yeah, we can is see it, your mouth. Is it moving? Yes, it's moving. You can see it? Yeah. I didn't know that's neat. I didn't know you could see it. Okay, that makes it easier, huh? I don't know. I'm old. I don't do this computer stuff. Okay, good. That makes it easier. All right. So that's gallbladder. That's the liver. 
and we're basically looking as we go over here, look, cutting right about up there. So rib cage here, and these are kidneys. This is part of the spine. This is something called a pancreas, which I transplant, helps with digestion and also insulin production. This is part of the stomach here, duodenum. This is something called the aorta, carries blood all the way down to the leg. This is the inferior vena cava, that carries blood back up to the heart from the lower extremity. We'll look at something later with the aorta. Um, these are intestines. You can see all the little um, rough edges. It's open because it's air in it. Okay, same thing. And, and this out here is fat around there. These are back muscles. Okay, so this is another, so this is cutting people front to back um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a plane that goes this way. This next x-ray in the middle is cutting them in the front like that. So again, liver, you see the intestines here. This is something called the superior mesenteric artery that comes off of this aorta that serves all the intestines. All right, part of the stomach. Here's the bottom part of the heart. Pelvis here, bladder. Okay. Uh, Dr. Young, we have a Good. question. If someone what? has internal bleeding, oh, yeah. um, which x-ray would you use? Well, for trauma, they, they do use ultrasound. It's gotten a lot better and can differentiate. It really, if, 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 you, if, you, if you're really in a, in a rush, you can do uh, something called a fast exam to see if there's fluid in there. If not, the CT, now they can go do the entire body in like a couple minutes. So a CT scan is really the best resolution to see where it is and where it might be, especially if there's a gunshot wound or there's a blunt trauma, have a head-on crash. Then, then you can hold a lot of blood in here. You can hold your entire blood volume in here. Your belly would blow up, but if it starts leaking out of vessels, arteries, and veins until it had enough external pressure, it'll just keep leaking and leaking. But usually uh, a CAT scan is best. Mm -hmm. I was going to mention uh, Dr. Rissier that's on the Zoom with us is going to talk about ultrasound tomorrow. Oh, good. Yeah, he can tell you all the, all, all the different um, ways you can use that. So this is another type of I think of you may have missed one question. Oh, there was okay. a question about an oral maxillofacial surgery residency. So yeah. would a six-year MD integrated OMFS residency prepare you better for cases like that oh, rather yeah. than a four-year? Or, or what? Rather than a four-year residency. Oh, I have no... A 60 wow. MD integrated residency with oral maxillofacial surgery. From what I remember from last year, they, they do, yeah. it's like eight or 10 years training for that. Um, so, yeah, it all, the, it all depends if they're integrated. That means you're going to do your dentistry and then go and do that. The other four years, maybe that they go, go and do all your dentistry first and then go into a fellowship. So if it's integrated, you do your dentistry and, and it as one continuous thing at the same place with um, uh, the four years or five years after, you may do your dentistry one place and then go somewhere else. But you just have, have to look, look at the timing and what they train you to do. You know, it, the, all the programs could be different in terms of how, how fancy they do. But most of them will do all that facial stuff and reconstruction. So we have another, another question. Do the, these mm -hmm. kinds of scans have any effects on the cells? And uh, yeah. On the cells, the radiation from these things is a lot lower than they used to be. Um, like for children, we don't like to go and give them lots of x-rays anyway. Any x-rays are, are bad because why are x-rays bad? See, open up another question. What do x-rays do? What do, what do they damage? Give off radiation. Huh? They give what, off radiation. What are, what, so why are x-rays bad? What do they do? The answer says they give off radiation. Yeah. It may cause any type of cancers. Why? They can. Due to the radiation. But why? Like the people in Hiroshima had a lot of problems with thyroid cancer. So we've got answers coming in. Uh, right. Lead to cancer, cause mutations, ah, mutations, DNA damage. Oh, we've got a uh, disrupt right. the electron orbitals. There you go. 
Yeah, it'll, cells, it'll knock them cells, out. Ionizing. All right. Left. So the, the X rays damages the, the DNA. So it can knock out um, um, chains, it can cause breaks. Then you can get skip mutations, you can get frame shift, frame shift mutations, and those mutations subsequently lead to cancers. So that's why X rays are bad. So the, the, the amount of X rays that you get from this is, is a lot lower than it is. So example, when they go up into space on the shuttle, they can only go up so far because the radiation gets too much. And there are examples of when they've gotten up to 400 miles that the astronauts started seeing stars in their eyes. And the reason is those big gamma radiation was hitting their retinas. And that's why they were experiencing that. That's why they usually don't go up much higher than that. So we have another, another comment, uh, protein transcription, harm it. If your DNA gets messed yeah. up, that will affect your protein. All, all of that is absolutely correct. So you, you, you disrupt all of those mechanisms. So normally, there, there, there are going to be errors in copying. And so you have DNA repair mechanisms that get rid of things that are not normal. If those mechanisms are, are, are affected or you, you just get overwhelmed, with the number of injuries that you have, then you can develop cancers. But yeah, but all those x-rays um, can cause problems cumulatively. But the x-rays they have now is a lot lower dose. If you have a tumor, they will use x-rays, external beam radiation, but in a very small area. Those are folks who really love physics. That, that's great for if you love physics and figuring out all that, they can go into that type of medicine. Um, where they with a nuclear medicine or they can do um, radiation meta radiation oncology where they go and put things in brains and shoot gamma radiation all that fancy stuff but you have to calculate the dose and all that so it's really neat all right anything else before we go on to these next horrific injuries um, all right here's a little bit different place what are what what type where where is this We've got pelvis coming in. <laughs> lots and lots of pelvis. Yeah, now, the, now these, 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 this is bad. Look at this first one. You see this hip bone here? Hmm. That hip bone is not supposed to be coming out of that orifice. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, my is right. <laughs> so this is really bad. I, 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 th this hurts. Th th it all says this is really bad because this part, the, the head of the femur is supposed to be up here in the acetabulum. That is really bad. And so, this, uh, this leg is broken too. Yeah. Darrell, Darrell uh, I think that would qualify as a dislocation. Yes. I, I'm not a physician, but. Uh, I think that's fair to say. <laughs> a dislocation, under, this, this is bad. Yeah. So they'd have to pull this leg out this way and, and then pop it back in there. But this, but the, the the joint here could be disrupted. This is this this is usually a car accident. will do this, where you get T bone and have enough force that it would dislocate the hip like that. This one is a bad one too. The 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 middle one. You say, well, oh, that doesn't look too bad. Well, these two bones are the pubis are supposed to be next to each other, and if you remember back here on the CT, look what sits there. See how close they are together. Look at that one. Ooh. So the bladder sits right behind that bone, right? Ooh. Imagine what that does to the bladder. Imagine what that does to something called the urethra. What the urethra is, it carries urine. Out here are the kidneys. You have ureters carried into the bladder. Then you have the urethra that comes out. You can get something called a urethral disruption because of this, where it just tears it apart. And then the patient can't pee, or they have blood at the where they normally urinate, and that's a bad urologic problem. And that's oftentimes urology has to go in there and fix that. Not only your um, orthopedic fix this um, uh, separation, but they got to fix the bladder as well. You can also have blood vessels being torn too. Um, the third panel is just a, a where the hip has been, where the femur has been driven into the hip here and just crushed it here. Um, this one is looks more like it's moth-eaten. This is probably 
more of a tumor that's eaten away at the ilium. And you can see how it's not that nice round stuff. So this is a more of a tumor picture here. And here are fractures of the of the ilium. That takes a lot of force. Usually this is from the back. And they have also other fractures here in the pubic ramus as well. So this takes a lot of force to do this. These are usually car accidents. And so young before but, but, you go on, we have some Oh. Um, Ashley, do you want to ask your question? Do you want me to read it for you? Oh. Um, basically, I was just wondering from like the first picture, like could they potentially be like paralyzed or lose their leg or just lose feeling yeah. in the area? Yeah, that's very possible. They could also have disruption of the blood vessels that run down here. The femoral artery, femoral vein could be torn off. Um, the nerve could have been disrupted. Yeah, this is the, absolutely. It's uh, one of those things where you try to repair it and then you see what problems you have afterwards. But yeah, they may never walk right after this. And um, Kennedy, do you, wanna, do you wanna talk about your comment? Sure. Who, me? Kennedy, no, Kennedy. Oh, Kennedy, go. Oh, I was saying that my grandfather told me he doesn't have a hip, he just has a spacer there. I think that's what he said it was called. Like, where would that be and what is it? Does he, does he walk? He can walk, but not very far and not very good. But he says he doesn't, this is the hip here. So this is something called a greater trochanter, lesser trochanter. And this is the, the, the femur here. And this is the joint here. I'm not, sh he's got to have something here if he can walk. Because the, your weight goes down the bone. So he's got to have something here. Um, he may have a replaced hip where they do something that's titanium. They can replace that. But that's why I asked him if he walked or not, because he would okay. have to have I don't really know like the medical terms for it. No. So I can't like explain it to you all the way, but I was just sure. wondering if you knew about that. No, he would, there, there are times that people have tumors or this is just so bad that they will um, just take that bone out. And sometimes if there's really a problem, they'll even take, do something called a hip disarticulation Especially if you have a tumor, just take all that out and just um, cover over the skin and leave a leave a um, hump there. But um, usually, you need to have some support there if you're going to walk on it. But here's okay. all. That's oh, what no. I was thinking. Thank no you. Problem. Oh yeah, no problem. And then Augustine, uh, you got another comment? Um, okay. Do you want to? Oh, I was like, how, how does that heal? Like, what, what are the, what, what's the procedure to get that back back together? They would have something called traction for this leg, so they would put something at, the, at their foot and just keep cranking it and cranking it and cranking it until that popped back into where it was supposed to be. Mm. Back yeah, to the mm, rack right. again. <laughs> and same thing, with, same thing with this hip over here, um, because what happens, the muscles contract and you get blood in there as well. So you just can't pull it yourself, but you're gonna have to get a traction. It really looks medieval in order to pull the bone out to try to set it back in place. And then they, they go fix it with rods and plates and all of that. But yeah, they, this is a pretty bad injury. But I'll show you some other pictures. So this is a pelvis, a close-up shot, the bottom of your spine, the lumbar, transverse processes are just little bones that come out, sacrum, and then you see the, the wings of the ilium, uh, pubic arch, which we talked about, pubic turbicle, Initium, and it, fractures can occur anywhere, but uh, but again, it takes a lot of force to fracture a pelvis. So here are some pictures of how how you can fix it. Again, they are getting medieval on these people. So this is a pubic arch repair. This person had problems with their so they fix it to the spine here and then down into the ilium. It, they probably had a fracture at the sacroiliac joint here. This say, oh, let me go back. This sacroiliac joint here is what loosens when women are about to give birth or going up to it. And that's why their back hurts so much because this will separate to make room for the baby's head to come down. So this sacroiliac joint will start to separate and then get back pain from that. But again, with these orthopods, they, they like driving nails everywhere. Look at all that. They, they put nails and screws. Look at that one. That just looks. I don't know what's worse, the repair or the injury.
but you can see all the different things they have to do. Why well, just set the bone to put it back where it's supposed to be? All right, questions before the next set of fun? No? Okay. All right. So Wait, what about there is, sorry, there is Dr. Young, there is a question. Okay. Uh, would you like to ask it? Juanita? I was asking would bed rest be typical for patients with these injuries? I'm sorry? Would bed rest be typical for patients? Oh, good question. Yeah. Um, yeah. With, the, with these types of injuries, yeah, they're going to need to sit still. There are times they can put those big casts, and sometimes on comedies they make fun of folks all, all casted up and so forth. Um, yeah, they're, they're obviously at bed rest because they're not going anywhere. But the same thing. These, these types of injuries are harder to immobilize. So, yeah, they'll be at bed rest. They might, may or may not have a cast. I don't know. I'm not an orthopod to know when they would use a cast. But the same thing, you've got to have, have enough um, um, stability and rest in order for these bones to heal. Because there are lots of muscles all around here. They're going to be trying to pull the bones out of place. So, yes. So here we are some more with some fractures. Since we already talked about them, you can see how that's all destroyed here, that femoral neck. Here's the femoral head going to something called an acetabulum. Here's a fracture here. Look at that one just completely crushed. So if they can't fix that, sometimes they'll go and take it off and replace the joint. This is an example of a fracture of someone who's already had a joint. But here, so some of these may be so bad that they have to replace this femoral head with, with titanium. So they replace that femoral head as well as the joint capsule here. It's what Prince had. No, you know Prince? Or, you, or am I still too? Y'all know who Prince is. I hope. Thank Purple you, Rain. Yeah. <laughs> Little guy. He used, he used to do splits all the time. He grew up with me. Uh, well, not with me. I wasn't in Minnesota. But, uh, but uh, that's why he tore up his hips by doing all those splits. And he ended up with hip replacements. And that's why he supposedly had so much pain. And that's why he was taking pain medicine. But he had his hips replaced because this can also, if you got enough damage from osteoarthritis where they just can't repair it, then they'll replace it. This x-ray down, this picture down here shows a replaced hip that also fractured as well. Uh, we have another, uh, well, Kalia uh, asked, where is it? Um, how long does the surgery take? Oh. Uh, and well, okay. asked, uh, would there be issues with friction on the titanium. Okay, the, um, the, they, the orthopods are pretty slick nowadays. They, they can do a hip in less than an hour now, especially if there's, if it's arthritis or something like that. Folk, they even send folks home the same day. Now they've gotten so good at it. But yeah, um, what they do, this ball, this titanium ball then goes into this joint, but the joint has silicone or something like that in it that allows it to move around. So it decreases the amount of friction. But these things can break down. It's what happened, I don't know if you guys know Bo Jackson. He was an awesome um, football player and baseball player. I don't know a whole lot of um, athletes that can do baseball and football, but he broke his hip when he was, when he was playing for the Oakland Raiders in a very odd way. And, um, but he couldn't come back and um, play football again because it just can't take the same amount of force on it. But he had a replaced hip. Um, from that. So again, a uh, close-up picture of a hip, the femoral head, and that's what they go and replace here. And this is a little bit closer um, example. So femoral head, acetabulum, it's like a little cup that it fits into, and then the ligament, uh, they have the femur. So you saw that other one. So there's a ligament in here that holds that in place. So in order to get that type of injury, they had to rip all of that apart. That takes a lot of force. Dr. Young, uh, Jacob, yeah. uh, do you, you have a question? Oh, yes. Um, yeah. So when you said that Prince, he did a lot of splits and had to get the, his hip re um, replaced? Yeah, both of them. Um, is that because he was male or is it just because, like, that's just normal for both? Yeah, I, I, just, I just think that, again, I don't have his medical records, but more likely than not, it's from all that wear and tear. You know, okay. he, he, you know, Doing splits is like, 
I, it's just not, unless you're a gymnast, you just shouldn't be doing split. Because, but after all those years, he just wore the joint out. And more likely than not, he got little pieces of bone in there and got arthritis, and they had to replace it. If it gets really gnarly inside, it'll hurt when you try to um, walk because the surface isn't smooth anymore. But more likely than not, from doing all those splits, he um, just tore, he just wore down the joint so much. And um, Emery, uh, did your question get answered? Do you want to talk? Hey there. Um, yeah, I just was going to ask how long the healing process is. Yeah, everybody, everybody's different. It's probably going to take a month or two. But after this, you're going to need physical therapy. Folks are going to have to come back, especially older folks. They're going to they're need help to get up and move. They're probably debilitated to begin with. And a lot of times, um, hip fractures are very common in um, the elderly population of which I'm quickly approaching. Falling down steps and they break their hips, but afterwards they get it fixed, they go to rehab, they go to nursing homes, where they have to get their muscles stronger. But a lot of times they're already debilitated to begin with, and, they, and the muscles aren't as strong. And so that's why PT is extremely important, especially as the population gets older. Uh, what is it, 10,000 baby boomers are retiring every day? And baby boomers ran from, what, 1945 to 1964, like 75 million of them. The generation after that is about 35 million. And then I guess your generation, the one before you, it bumped back up again. So there are a lot of baby boomers um, uh, that are going to need a lot of physical therapy for injuries, uh, but also for arthritis and lots of other things. So folks going into PT will be more busy than they can imagine. So time-wise, what do you want to do? Yeah, so we were gonna, we were, we've gone about 50 minutes and we were talking about maybe taking a break um, so we can keep going or you guys can take a break. So if you want to put in the chat what your preference is, we'll kind of go with the majority. Keep going. More we'll keep going. Lots oh of keep God. going. Uh, keep it coming. Oh, right. I'm running out of juice. I gotta I'm to get some more. See, I can't just drink water. I got I to gotta do my meal. I, I, I drink a lot of water. I got to stop drinking soda. You know, you look at it like 200 calories. Oh, my gosh. It's crazy. The high fructose corn syrup. That stuff is like devil's juice. All right. Why are you drinking it then? I'm not. It's my meal. <laughs> it just doesn't have sugar in it. All right. What's next? All right. So here are some repairs. Some examples of that hip fracture. Here you can see the fracture here. So they fix it in two places. One, so the greater tro trochanter through the head, of the head of the femur and the neck and also down the shaft. So they'll make an incision on the side and to, to connect all this stuff. Again, I don't do this, but they make an incision here and put all that, put all that hardware in there in order to stabilize um, that hardware against the joint. And this is an example of a, a replaced hip. This is repair of fractures, but here's a replaced hip. Here's an example of what you were asking about the titanium and the acetabulum if it gets worn down. Here, here's the acetabulum that they put in the, uh, uh, an artificial acetabulum. You see that um, cup here? That, that's to replace this here. Ah. So they'll, put, they'll take the head of the leg off and put this right angle joint this at a little bit more than a right angle but then that head of that acetabulum of that of that titanium goes into here all right and as i said there are lots of different ways to fix them but that's the standard way and again physical therapy is extremely important um as, as especially for all, all older folks they are much more likely um, to break a hip but this is another example. Someone falls down the steps, they can't get up, they come into the hospital and the bone is all out of place. In the old days when I was a resident, we'd have to put them on a, a buckboard and crank their leg. We, we not, they, they in the OR. We wouldn't do it while they were awake. That, that's pretty cruel. But crank it, crank it, crank it um, until, it, until it reduced and it was no longer dislocated, dislocated, not in the right spot. And then the orthopods would go and fix it. All right, now for the, uh, whoa, 
Well, okay, go back. Why? before you go on, Darrell, you've got a question? Go on, Darrell, don't be shy. Uh, yes, I was just going to ask, like, when you're performing the incisions and trying to get to the bone, is there yeah. like any risk to the muscles when trying to get to the bone? Because don't you have to move the muscle out the way or cut into it yeah. or something? Yeah, you, you can do it. There, there's certain planes you can go through to spread them apart. Sometimes they may have to cut some, but then, yeah, they, they can spread them apart to get down to it. You try to minimize the amount of injury um, to the surrounding tissue as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now something for the eye people. So what are these? What do you think these might be? Orbitals. Come on. Uh huh. Where's our Where's our optometry people? There nice. we go. Yeah, I put something in there for you. Here we go. Blowout, blowout fracture. Um, oh, very good! Yay! The tumors. These are our answers. All right. So, it's is something called an Ooh. orbital blowout fracture. And there's different ways to get it, usually by getting hit in the eye. But you can see that this person, they're asking this person to look up. They're looking up with that eye, but they're not with this one. Okay, we'll get to why that is. So, this is a CT scan. And you can see the floor here. That floor is intact, that is not. It looks like it has a trap door on it. That's not good. And here's another example of where there's a fracture here. Fracture here. And you see, see how this sinus is all open? Because there's air in it. This one is all filled with blood and all a bunch of gunk because they, they broke the bottom of their eye, but also broke their zygomatic arch here. So they blew out that and blew out that. This is probably more so a tumor here with this poor child. But they still have sort of, but this, as I said, this, this is more of a tumor. This is a little bit different. But these are injuries to the eye here, okay? So, so Dr. Yaman, uh, do you want to ask your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering what the difference was between an orbital blowout fracture and just a regular orbital fracture. Okay, blowout, see the floor? It's blown out. The door is open. Whereas you could have fracture of the, of the bones around the eye, but not have uh, a blowout fracture whereby the eye is trapped. It can still move around. This eye can't move because the muscles are trapped in that area that was blown out. So they get they get stuck. There's there, these, these muscles here. See, there's four groups of muscles that control the eye's movement. So this bottom one gets trapped along the fractured bone. So when they ask them to look up, they can't because the, because the eye is trapped looking downwards because it can't rotate up because a muscle is trapped in there. So when they try to look up, they can't because the muscle running this way can't release for the other muscles to pull the eye up. Okay. So, okay, so that's a they're different. They're different size. The, the orbit is very um, is fragile. There's a zygomatic bone surface. This bone here, the zygomatic arch. There's sphenoid. There's sphenoid sinuses. That's in the back. Frontal bone here. Maxillary bone. Nasal bone. Ethmoid bone. There's also ethmoid sinuses. So the the, the bones in here are very fragile. So it's not, it, it doesn't take an excessive amount of force to break them. They're almost paper thin with that. And that you can get hit with a punch. You get a baseball, that's not uncommon, or it breaks, uh, breaks that um, um, zygomatic arch and blows out the floor because it buckles and then it breaks down and the muscles get trapped. Okay. So fixing it, you know, again, I'm not an eye, eye surgeon. I'm not sure. The, the maxillofacial folks might do this as well. I think they do. Um, they may go in there with the opto uh, ophthalmologist uh, in order to, to check the vision all. But this is probably something that the, uh, the oral maxillofacial folks do as well. But you see, with these fractures, they got to fix the zygomatic arch and then put a new netting. 
and the bottom of that floor, that maxillary bone. But here's a good picture of that, of this bone, of this muscle being trapped in here. I'm not sure what this is. I don't know if there's something put in there to try to help buttress that bone. But you can see the different things that they have to do. Again, plating and so forth. Now, now you wouldn't put a cast on this because it's not going to move around or not. I guess it'd be kind of hard to put a cast on your head, but that's really not necessary. You just need to make this immobile. All right, questions? And it can take time for that to heal. And, and people may have um, visual disturbances because of it. The, the vitreous in the eye could get blood in it, and that vitreous can take a long time to clear up. And then you can also have a retinal detachment because of the injury to it. Remember, you have your, your cornea, your lens, it goes through the vitreous back to the back of the retina. So that could be dislocated as well. So get, getting these types of um, injuries is not only the bones, but also can severely affect the eye too and your vision afterwards. All right. Uh-oh. Here's some more CT scans. And we can go through some more things. Any questions for that last set? All right, so we, talk, we talked a little about CT. Again, here these things are labeled. Again, they're cutting people like this, like that. You have a liver, again, the kidney on the right. So on the CT scan, the left side is the right side because the head is up top, okay? So we're looking from the feet up with the CAT scan. So the liver's on the right side, under the right side of the lib, ribs, the kidney, right, left kidney. And this is left renal vein. That's blood that flows out of the left kidney into something called the inferior vena cava, which carries blood back to the heart. Duodenum is part of the, duodenum is part of the intestinal tract. And you have intestines here. And this example is superior mesenteric artery that comes off the aorta to serve blood to all the intestines. And the vein goes along with it. And these, these are the rectus muscles. Everybody wants a six pack, I guess. And those, those are examples of what they look like. Okay. And again, liver, stomach, and spleen a little bit further up. And that's pretty much you know, similar to that. All right. So you saw normal kidneys. Okay. Little kidney beans. What do you think about those? What thing is not like the other? Remember Sesame Street? Isn't it Sesame Street? These two things are not like the other. I don't know. Anyway. Polycystic? Very good. Polycystic kidneys. So what this is a defect in a collagen mechanism. And so these folks tend to get big cysts, not only in their liver. See that liver is normal. Look at all the big cysts in there. The walls get filled with fluid because the collagen isn't quite right. And then these kidneys can get ginormous. Look how big they were, these big cysts coming out of them. Look at this one. These things are just gigantic. And, and these are bad because the folks can't eat because it compresses their stomach. They can have back pain. They can bleed. They can have recurrent urinary tract infections. And of course, eventually renal failure. So for me, I, 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 I've taken out kidneys like this um, in the OR, make a long incision down the midline and try to hunker the, they, they can be gigantic, um, try to get them out. Um, they are able to take them out laparoscopically now. They, they do, they pop all the cysts and make the kidney a lot smaller. So a lot more folks are done like that, but we still take, take some out um, open. But these are big polycystic kidneys that are that have defect in the walls of the cells of the of the of the um, kidneys and liver, but these people also have about a 10 15 percent chance of having aneurysms in their brain because the collagen there can be abnormal, and it's not uncommon for these folks to die of, of aneurysms in their brain. So you can see how big these kidneys can get, and we take these kidneys out. It's like for this one. There's no room for me to put a kidney down here. This is normally where we put the kidney, make an incision and stuck, stick a kidney here. 
if there's no room, then this big kidney here is going to push on the transplant I put in. So we oftentimes have folks like this get their kidneys out ahead of time. All right, more fractures. So where are we? The knee. The knee. So, okay, aside from, so there's a little bit more advanced question. Remember, so it's not just bone. Now this could be an injury in football, okay? Someone's hit head on with a helmet. And uh, so aside, what else, and that's a hard question, but anyway, what else might be injured with an injury like that? Meniscus is coming in, kneecap, tendons. Yeah. What ACL, else? ACL. All those ACL. ligaments can be torn. What else might be around there? What else might be? So you have bones, you have muscles. What else do you have? Cruciate ligaments, synovial okay. fluid. Yeah. What else do you have? Keep them how, how, do, how do your toes live? Blood supply. There's Blood. your arteries coming in. Yeah. So. Uh, mm-hmm. So back here, remember this aorta, where is it? Uh, this aorta comes and goes down the legs too, and it runs behind the knee. Something called a popliteal artery and vein. So the problem with this injury is that this bone could, could have disrupted the um, popliteal artery. And that's bad because everything below it isn't gonna get any more blood. It can also affect the nerve as well, but getting a, getting an injury to the popliteal artery could lead to the loss of the leg as well. So this injury is very, very dangerous. And that's something that we have a trauma, you gotta make sure that they um, have pulses in their feet. If not, that you really gotta, you gotta go and fix it anyway. Um, but that's one of the injuries. So it's not just the bones, you gotta think what's around the bone, what else could be affected. And you can see this dog putting their finger between, um, this kneecap that, that's been fractured. You can fall down and hit it, but this is usually an injury. It could be a car accident, but a football injury could also do that as well. So here's the kneecap, the knee. You can see all that. There can be different fractures along here. And here's an example of the popliteal artery that runs right behind the knee. And all those ligaments can be disrupted without a question. They're gonna be need, need to be reconstructed. If this popliteal artery is, is very injured, it may need to be repaired or, or cut and, and, have, and be replaced. And you can imagine with all these ligaments torn that rehab is going to, with physical therapy is gonna be extremely important with that. So it's not just the bones that can be injured, but it also you gotta think about what other structures are gonna be around it. So the folks that are in PT, you're gonna read about what injury they had, how it was fixed, and you're gonna get instructions and you'll have your um, set ways to do the um, uh, physical therapy, different exercises. That, that's a big with, with bands and all of that and to try to strengthen the knee to try to get it back and stabilize it. Cause you can imagine all the stuff that's disrupted there. So you can, uh, question? Oh, sorry, I thought you stopped. Um, Amaya has a question. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering what the standard replacement would be for that artery. For that artery. So if I can't if I can't fix it directly, like opening it up, there are different layers of the artery, and so you, you you have to try to repair all of them so the blood goes through. You can get something called a dissection, where the blood is going in the wrong layer. There's three layers, and you can get it into the wrong layer. So if you can't repair that directly, we have artificial material, something called Gore-Tex, PTFE, and something called polytetrafluoroethylene. They make clothes out of it as well. We also have other materials. You can use a vein sometimes, um, a saphenous vein, which is which in the upper leg. Um, there's also something called artograph, which is a bull carotid artery. So there's different ways to try to reconstruct it if it's really destroyed. But you try not to use those artificial materials unless you just don't have a choice. Okay, and August, do you want to ask your question? Are you there? He, he, um, he asked, what would PT consist of for an injury like that? Oh, I don't know. 
a lot of work. I don't know who exercises. Good question, but I don't know. I'm not a PT folks person. But a lot of exercises that try to strengthen the muscles of, 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 the, of, the, of the thigh to try to help stabilize the knee. Okay, the quadriceps, the hamstrings. So doing exercises, being on machines or resistance banding to try to um, strengthen the knee as much as possible possible but the exact exercises i'm not sure of you know how long uh therapy would take for something like that oh, Just Lord, it, it could take it could take weeks it, it could take months to for a devastating injury like that this if this was a football injury that person probably never played football again but it, it, it could take a very long time um to heal it but also to get to the point uh, they they may have a permanent limp with this so it can take a while. Again, it all depends on, on the age of the patient. That's one thing the PT folks have to think about. How old is my patient? What kind of health is my patient in? What are they able to do in rehab? You know, so all those things come into play when you're examining somebody and try to figure out and try to develop a, a game plan for them. You got to think about all those different components. Anything else? All right, so these are some quick examples of how they repair the knees much like the other screws and wires and everything like that all the all different things so they probably this person probably fell over and just hit their kneecap all right now something a little bit different going back to the head what do you think these are <clears throat> Got cysts, tumor, cyst, mm -hmm. facial tumors, more tumors. Go. And that's correct. They're in the in the mandible that we talked about before. This 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 is this is a benign condition. The name um, next door. Um, sorry, sorry. Is that your dog? Put that dog down. Yeah, someone just came to the door. I'll be right back. Okay, great. So this is cystic. You can see all these holes. And yeah, I'm not sure what condition it is, but you can see this molar here is stuck in the middle of all this. More tumors here displacing the teeth. So once that's repaired, these teeth may need braces in order to correct that. And once they take it, or they may need to take out part of the jaw in order to repair it and get a, get a, get a wire or titanium if they can't... Um, if they can't just get the bone tumor out itself. So th this, this, this example of, a, of, a, the, uh, of a, what is this called? This is a odontogenic fibromyxoma of the mandible. Um, th this is a benign tumor, but you can see how big this is. More likely than not, these folks are um, in Africa because usually in the U.S., they usually don't get this bad. If someone's going to go and take care of these folks before they get to this point. But that's why mission work is so great if you're able to do it, that more likely than not this child was taken care of um, on a mission trip where they were able to resect that tumor. Now, they may lose part of the jaw, may lose um, some of their teeth, um, but also they can get very weak because they're not able to eat. And you can see what, they're able to, what they were able to do with this, um, with this woman how big this thing got. But again, usually in the US, you're not gonna get something that, that displaced. But for something like this, more like if they weren't able to shave this tumor off and leave her mandible, they can sometimes go and put a titanium um, jaw in like that. Just like they did the titanium hips, they can do that. And they did a great job trying to reconstruct her skin. This is another thing where a plastic surgeon can come in to try to help reconstruct this the best they can. So they, there are lots of different tumors that, that can arise that, that would need multidisciplinary um, teams in order to try to get a good cosmetic result. Dr. Young, I think you answered this question about oh. the cyst covering the whole mouth, whether the person can eat. And I think you said that the person yeah. is unable. It, it, so this person could potentially starve because there's, there's just no way. Um, so nutrition can be a, a big problem. Um, for, for, for these poor folks to try to drink. But, but again, as I said, mission trips um, are, are great because you're really able to um, 
help folks, all, all different types. All, I think they have mission trips for all, all sorts of medicine and go over there uh, to different places to help folks who otherwise wouldn't have the medical care or the expertise to try to repair the things that they have. And there was a question about how to start mission work. I don't know if you have any answers for that if you're undergraduate, but I know from medical oh, yeah. school, they have opportunities to do that. Uh, absolutely. There, there are lots of um, um, uh, mission groups uh, that are international. The Doctors Without Borders is a big one. Um, people can go through their faith organizations and do it, but there, there are lots of organizations where once you get to be a professional, you can go. I went a long time ago. I really need to do it again, but I went on. For what I do, I'd have to do general surgery. No, I'm not going to go um, to a, to a third world and do a kidney transplant. But um, but you're but you're able to go. When I went long ago, we I, I was doing basic uh, medicine, treat, treating scabies and and um, ringworm. And I had a poor woman who had. Um, uh, HIV. She had like six kids come, but we didn't have medicines to treat. It was very sad. But um, but from the from physical therapy, surgery, and dentistry, yeah, you can certainly find mission trips that you can go on to go and give your talents to help folks that don't have that ability to take care of themselves, or or their country doesn't have the ability to take care of. Them. And Dr. Young, uh, Hannah, do you want to ask your question? Mm -hmm. Maybe she's not, um, she asked yeah, about, no, oh. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, so my question was like, could they eat with a feeding tube since they can't like put food in your mouth? Yeah, that, you, more likely than not, th these folks being where they are aren't gonna have a feeding tube, either down their nose or through their belly. They aren't gonna have that. So more likely than not, they were subsisting on liquids. And, but the problem with this, you're at a risk of choking too. So fortunately, they, they were young enough. But if this kept going, they would have died without a, without a doubt because eventually they couldn't get enough nutrition in. So that's why this operation was life-saving to these, to these kids. All right. All right. So where are we now? We're still at the knee, but what part of the knee? So what bone is this? We talked about it, this long one. Any thoughts? Femur. Femur. So Lots this, of femurs coming in. So that's femur. So what should this one be? We had it in the first, I don't want to go all the way back, but we had it in tibia. the first. Tibia. We get lots of tibias. Tibia and the fibula. That, that little bone on the side. It's a lot of times football players break that one way down at the ankle they tackle the wrong way but this is a tibial plateau fracture this is all again there's lots of different ways to fracture these bones um there's lots of different types and they they have different um repairs so uh, all all these fractures can can show differently and have different examples but usually it takes a lot of trauma to try to break these knees and again they go ahead and and, and have this buttress of, of, of wires and plates in order to try to reconstruct it. Um, here's an example where they made an incision in order to, made a flap actually, in order to put that hardware in. You can see how they put it in here. This actually may have been a tumor here that they cut out, but they, then they had to reconstruct it and, 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 and buttress the bone. But you can see if you, if you like that sort of stuff, that's really neat doing orthopedics. Um, they're like they're the, the carpenters of medicine, and they also nail them too. Which where where you do one versus the other, I have no idea. All right, CTs again. We're gonna get a little bit different here. So again, we talked about the liver. So this this is the muscles on the side, the oblique muscle. This is up top. Stomach has contrast in it. And they, we use, they, they use something that has um, barium in it and other things that are radio opaque. The bone is white because it absorbed the x-rays, kidneys, gallbladder. Okay, do you, do you guys know what, what goes into the gallbladder? 
bile's coming in as answers and answers. So, so the liver produces bile along with it's like the big um scrubber of the blood. So it produces bile. What does the bile do? <clears throat> Any thoughts as to what the bile does? Emulsify fats. For, uh, Very good. Down lipids. All right. So it does. That's why. That's why your stools are brown, because of the bile in there. All right. So the gallbladder just holds it. it it's so when you eat, the bile comes out to help helps with digestion. All the things you mentioned. So here's another uh, a close up of the gallbladder. It's a little bit thick and walled here. Not a whole lot. A little bit. So how's this gallbladder different from these other ones? What do you see here? <clears throat> so one, someone says sw uh, swollen. Yes, yeah, swollen, good, edema. So here there's no space with this one. It's right up against it, but here there's a space and there's this thick line around the gallbladder. See that? So more likely than not, this is something called acute cholecystitis, meaning that the gallbladder is inflamed and swollen, and that fluid has, has caused that space to create, be created. And as a result, folks are going to have pain with that. Okay? So a lot of times what we do, we try to get this cooled off. Don't let them eat maybe just liquids, and eventually they'll need to have their gallbladder out because it could happen again. And there's lots of different reasons why the gallbladder can get inflamed and have problems. And one of them is in this picture. What do you think is going on in here? We've got gallstones. Mm -hmm. So you can see the gallstones here. These, are, these have calcium in them because they're white. Not all gallstones will show up. Um, so you have cholesterol stones. You can also have... Um, Heme, iron stones, um, sickle, people who have sickle cell disease are, are very prone to, to forming stones because of the blood breaking down. And they have too much of that blood breaking down because that's part of what makes the bile its color and they can form stones in here. And so sickle cell patients oftentimes need their gallbladders out because they form gallstones, because they have lysis of their... Um, of their red cells so much. Does anybody know why this, where, where they believe sickle cells came from and what it, what it, what, why they, they were there? Anybody know about that? Malaria, ways to fight malaria. All right, all right, malaria. So it's believed that it was a adaptive mechanism so there, there's the trypanosome. So the, from the mosquito transmitting malaria, it was thought that it was an adaptive mechanism um, in Africa where the sickle cell, it, it forms an S. There's a, there's a um, genetic mutation that instead of a round cell forms a sickle cell, that those cells are not infected by the um, trypanosome the way a round cell is. And so it was adaptive to try to prevent um, malaria from affecting the people. The problem is those sickle cells are not good because they get clogged up. They don't carry oxygen real well and they can get clogged up into joints. So sickle cell patients oftentimes have a lot of joint pain. They can have a sickle cell crisis, especially if their oxygen levels get low. It can be, it can be horrendous pain with them with that. What do you think this might be? Here's a liver again, kidney, aorta, pancreas. What do you think that might be? Ruptured gallbladder. It's possible. It would probably be spewing stuff this way. What else might it be? It looks like it's inside the liver, see? Could be a cyst, but what else could it might it be? It's kind of thick here. It could be a tumor too. So it's not uncommon to have gallbladder tumors. 
They, those are tough to deal with because of where they're located. So that could be a tumor as well, infiltrating into the liver. So the CAT scan gives us a good idea about um, what's going on. That, that ultrasound is very good. They can give us good information, but the CT scans can, can be a little bit more, um, can be more definitive. And this is just inflammation around the gallbladder here. There's a gallbladder that's full and, it, and it, there's inflammation around there. Okay, questions before we go to the next one? All right, we're getting there. All right, so, so here's a CT scan again. Okay, the spine. And then this big thing here carries blood to the rest of the body. So what do you think this is? And this. Any thoughts? So you can see how big this is. This is a normal one. This one. This is a normal size of this. See? Now it's like that. Dr. Assur is uh, adding in. Oh, yeah. Our, <laughs> our, our, our anatomy expert. Thank you. Oh, there. He should know. So this is something called abdominal aortic aneurysm. So what this is, is a dilation of the aorta. So the aorta is the big tube that comes out of the heart, to, serves blood to the head, to the chest, diaphragm, and then the blood comes down to the kidneys. And then there's something called the celiac plexus, it goes to the spleen, goes to the liver. This is superior mesenteric artery, goes to all the intestines. There's lumbar arteries that go to the spine. Then, then this section here is called infrarenal, below the renals. And then this splits at about the level of the belly button that goes down to the legs. And this is where I usually plug kidneys in here. Okay? So usually diet, um, high, high blood pressure can cause dilation of this, uh, of this area. This is a very common place to have a below. It can get bigger. It can, th these are bad ones because this aneurysm is all the way up. So why do you think this is a bad problem? So this is carried blood from the heart. Okay. So it's under what? It's coming out of the heart. Heart squeezing it out. Pressure. Pressure. So if you look at this, little itty bitty guy, okay? Why do you think this is a problem or could be a problem? Alex, do you want to answer? The pressure can make it explode and the blood go everywhere. And right. Out and die. It can rupture and they folks will die. So this, this has been here a while because if you look around the rim of it, it's white, like the bone. So there's calcium in this wall too, because this person probably has had high blood pressure a long time and made their arteries hard. But you're absolutely right that the wall can weaken. Instead of having a tight wall, just like a balloon, it, the, big, the bigger you blow the balloon, the thinner and thinner the wall gets until it explodes. And you'll, get to, you'll get to learn about the law of Laplace and physiology. Absolutely. And Very good. I hadn't gotten to it. in the physiology now. See, see how it all works <laughs> together? Yay. Laplace's law. Don't, don't ask me to quote it, but yeah, that's right. So when the wall gets thin like that with all that pressure, it can rupture and people can die. And you can do this is a big aneurysm. This is probably this type here that goes all the way up. So this is a type of CT. They gave them contrast in the artery, and then they reconstructed it from all the little pictures that they took. So these, these are very dangerous. So in the old days, they still do it now, and we'd have to go down through the belly, cut this out, and then put a, a tube in to cut all this out, and then put an artificial tube into the leg. Nowadays, they're, they're able to do it, something called endovascularly meaning they'll go through the leg and put these stents in there. 
in order to try to avoid those big operations down the belly, which are a lot better for the patient. But if they're too big, then they have to open them up. And opening somebody up to do this is, is a real pistol because this sits behind the intestines. You got to rotate the intestines all, make a big incision, rotate the intestines out of the way, dissect all this out. But then you have to worry about where you're sewing it in because you can knock off the arteries that go to the kidneys too. So th this is a very dangerous thing to have. Uh, Dr. Called, Young, uh, Juanita, yeah. do you want to ask your question? Um, I was asking, what are some signs of aneurysms? Um, pain in the belly. You can also, on exam, if you push down on them, you can feel it bouncing up against you. So you, oftentimes these folks will come in with a lot of abdominal pain or they could have back pain. The reason they have back pain is that it, the aorta is sitting right against the spine. And so this wall and the inflammation can cause them to have pain. So they can come in with back pain. So usually these occur in elderly people who have a lot of high blood pressure or they may have poor nutrition and poor um, connective tissue. And they can get pretty big and, and they may not even know it. It can be silent. It just gets bigger and bigger. That's why on exam, it's important to, to feel the belly as well, along with all the other things to see if they have an aneurysm because that, that's an emergency. Once it gets really over four centimeters, um, you wanna go and fix it because then the, then the risk of it rupturing goes up exponentially. And here's um, Allison, Allison has a comment. Okay. Allison. Um, maybe she's not, uh, so she, she was saying, mm -hmm. A common sign is a tearing pain to the back. Yeah, you can, you can, exactly. And that's because it's sitting there, because it's sitting in the back and you can feel that, absolutely. Okay. But you can see how all these x-rays can, can, can help a diagnosis. Now, you may have an idea of what it is just from physical exam, but these, these x-rays can give you a window into exactly what's going on. All right, now you guys are experts now, so you should know where this is, with the different types of fractures here. That really, that thing's completely dislocated off of the, off the foot. And this one, I think even has a cast around it. And so all the, you gotta learn all the little bones of the foot and all that. That's why learning your anatomy, uh, regardless of what you are in, um, in, in medicine or optometry or whatever, you got to know your anatomy. You got to know the bones. You got to know all the soft tissues, all the nerves and everything else that are serving it. So you can have an idea of what's broken and what could potentially be affected um, because of the break. And as I said earlier, this is an area down here where a lot of football players can get an ankle fracture from getting tackled or coming down like a wide receiver falling down um, um, in a strange way. It's not uncommon for them to break their fibula. And they're just going patch it there. And again, repairing nails and plates and all of that and physical therapy as well. You can also get torn ligaments from this. And so even though they fix the bones, it could be another thing where they need the physical therapy in order to try to um, um, get them back to function. So knowing, knowing your muscles and knowing their proper movements and all of that, it's going to be important because if someone gets the cast off, you're going to have to figure out what they're able to do, what they can't do, and try to get them back. And you'll measure their, their degrees of, of movement and all of that. So that's why all that's important. You may wonder um, why you learn all this basic science. All of this is because it forms a foundation for you to do all the next stuff. So I know it sounds like a pain or you just want to get and do it but you can't go and do the things you need to do unless you have that firm foundation. All right, so we did these. This is a little bit different. So look, so where is this? Here's a hip, what do you think this is? What bone is this? Femur. Femur, so bad femur fracture. Look at that, straight through. But I want you to look at this one. 
why is this one different than the others? And granted, the fractures are different, but what is it about this picture that's extremely concerning? Any thoughts? It's in extension, it's a baby. Ah, the baby. It's a small leg and the plates aren't sealed yet. So the question is, should a baby, let's say this, this child was not in an accident, car accident, but they come in with this. Why, why would that be concerning? How else can a child get a fracture like that? Abuse. Abuse, yeah. So that's very, very telltale that they should not, someone twisted this poor child's leg and broke it. So that's something where, where uh, folks in children's hospitals are very aware to call social work, call the uh, DHS or whatever the social work um, uh, uh, care set, uh, care folks are because this, this is a horrific injury. Also, green stick injury is where they twist their arm. It's just horrendous. But we know this is a baby because something called the epiphyseal plates aren't um, closed yet. They haven't sealed, but also it's a small leg. And again, there's lots of different femur fractures that you have. And again, rods and plates and all of that. All right, a little bit different. They're bones, but what do you think these are? Tumors. Tumors. So here's a tumor inside the bone. We hollowed it out. This one's growing outside of it. This one's growing outside of it too. Now bone tumors are, are, are common in children, especially something called os, um, um, Ewing sarcomas are common. You can also have osteogenic sarcomas, which are bad. They may result in amputation. A lot of times their chemo and radiation are, are a lot better trying to preserve the limbs, especially in children. But sometimes you just can't and they end up having um, an amputation. And one of our current students actually um, had that problem and they, they are in, in medical school and they're making it through. So the bone tumors can occur. Uh, I, I, bring, I bring that person up because even though that person had lost their arm that person is still doing extremely well in medical school they have not allowed that disability to thwart them and they made accommodations for physical for physical exams and all of that but they they are tenacious and they were not going to let anything stop them so there are lots of different bone tumors chondrosarcoma there's lots of different types so and then they can occur in different places so th this is an example of something called a, a, a nuclear medicine scan, PET scan. And this is um, a way that they give radioactive material that lights up in tumors. They inject it and they take a, a, and take a picture to see where the tumor that might be. Th this person has, is very bad because this person has um, metastatic disease. Metastatic means it goes all over the place but they have it all in their spine, in their hip, in their legs. This is, this is just horrendous because they have this metastatic bone disease and it could be breast cancer, it could be prostate cancer, but it's gone everywhere. And you can see it lit up. Now the liver is gonna light up some anyway because it's gonna concentrate that material, but you can see how it concentrated in the bone, the base of their skull, their hips and everything else. So you can have primary malignant bone tumors, lots of different types, but this is one example of where it's malignant or it's gone all over the place. So this is a different type of scan that they can use to follow up on patients to see whether or not they've had a remission of their, of their cancer as time goes on with their treatment. All right, so what, what time? We're 341, you tell me. Oh. You guys want to keep going or? Got a do couple you wanna... more, I think. I don't know. I think I have some more. 
Yeah. You want to put in the chat whether you want to keep going for a few more? It's been it's been an keep hour. Going. And 40 <laughs> keep going. We've got a lot of keep going. Yeah. Okay. So another CAT scan. All right. This is a little bit different. So rectus muscle, the six pack, oblique. You know, people do the oblique muscle. Mm -hmm. You have ooh, where are we? The spine again, hip bone. But look at all these things, all these bubbles. See all that? What do you think? Of, what do they look like? Tumors coming in. Look uh, how many of them there are. Do you think it's that? What else could it be? Let uh, me go back. Let me see if I can find. Is this kind of what happened to Aaron Hernandez, CTE? I don't know. No, no. Th this is abdomen. That you're talking about. CTE is is something called um, um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. That's in the brain. That's where um, football players get hit over and over and over again, and they have um, disruption of their uh, of their thinking and all of that. They have headaches and 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 they they lose it and they they become senile, unfortunately. Deja, do you want to? You've got some other comments there. Do you want to ask your? Hmm? So where are we? Hmm? De Sorry, Deja's got a. There you go. You want to unmute yourself and ask your questions? Have you ever seen or analyzed like a brain that has CT? Because I know you can't like when someone has CTE, you can't open someone's brain like when uh, they're alive. So you do like an autopsy on them. Have you yeah. ever seen? No, I haven't. That that. That that CTE was a diagnosis from that African American neurologist. Golly, I think Will Smith played him in a movie, Concussion. That 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 wasn't out when I was in medical school. They didn't know what it was. But no, that that's something called a post mortem after you die um, diagnosis. And I, I don't know the exact findings, but um, these these uh, players, even soccer players, anybody we have, and they're heading the ball because that ball is hard. They they get dementia. They can they see they senile. Um, they have headaches. It's really bad. You know what? One old uh, football player. He just don't even Terry Bradshaw has some. Uh, one of the football commentators. He has a mild case of it. But um, a lot of them are really affected by that. But we are in the abdomen, and all these all this is small bowel. This is bowel. They're not supposed to be that big. So these are examples of the intestine that are backed up and obstructed because the fluid can't get out. So you probably make between three to five liters a day from your stomach and swallowing and also from your pancreas and all. But all that stuff has to get around to get reabsorbed or and then you have your bowel movements as well. But if you have an obstruction somewhere, then all that's going to back up and folks can end up having the abdomens getting very big. They can end up vomiting and they can end up dying from this because what happens is that if this is not relieved, then all that pressure inside that intestine can, can exceed the blood flow going through it, especially on the vein side. So if the veins can't let the blood out, then what happens is that the tissue and the bowel can eventually die. And now, of course, the intestine is technically, the inside of the intestine is the outside because it has bacteria in everything and the bacteria can leak out and you get something called peritonitis and inflammation. You can get dead gut where sections of the intestine die. So this is, this is these types of... Um, Examples are very bad. And what you try to do is try to decompress them with a tube down their nose to try to hopefully suck the juice out. But if it doesn't get better, you have to go and operate and relieve the point of where it's usually twisted or hernias to let all this juice out. Otherwise, um, it can end up causing a, a people can die from, from these obstructions. So this, that's an example of a bowel obstruction. And they can take different forms here there's air, but there's also a lot of fluid that just can't get out the other end. So, so this is another example of where CT scans are so important. And you can see this is arrow is pointing to where the fluid is on one side and the air is on the other side. So this is called, something called air fluid level. 
and that's not good. It means the bowels just aren't moving and they look like sausages and they should be all compressed. All right, I think this might be the, the last set, so it's right on time anyway. So what do you think these are? <clears throat> Which we have too much in this country. Gunshots, I think. Nobody's answering, so I'm gonna huh? go. I said, I think gunshots, nobody's answering. So. Yeah, gunshot wound. Look at that. It's probably a shotgun. And look how it shot all, all those. Remember, they're made out of lead. And all and lead's heavy like, like calcium, so it's absorbing the x-rays. So it's completely shattered this bone, probably shattered the tissue around it, and basically broke that, broke, broke the uh, bone. Here, this, this person shot their foot. You can see how the bones are just completely shattered. You have all these little pieces of, um, of the shotgun left in there. This, this one has its jaw shattered. Here's a- uh, Kristen, it, uh, asking, did, Kristen, do you want to ask you a question? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Yeah. Um, in, in the first image, um, yeah. the humerus, I believe. Yes, very good. Um, did the bullet burst, like are those like- That's probably shotgun. So oh. with shotgun shells, there's lots of, lots of pellets. Usually with a single projectile, it usually stays intact. They can get deformed, but it usually stays intact. So this is probably shotguns. Now, some of this could be bone too. Like this could be bony fragments of, of, of a, it could, this could have been a single bullet, but shattered the jaw. But this is more likely than not a shotgun blast. It had lots of little pellets in it. Thank this you. Is, oh yeah, no problem. So that's single bullet to the shoulder, single bullet back here. See, the, the lungs are open and clear because it's air, bullet is solid. So this can go and hit a rib, break a rib. If it's lodged in the spine, it can settle the spinal cord. Here, it can puncture the lung and you get something called a pneumothorax where the lung will decompress, but the air will still leak out. So it, it builds up more and more, the lung collapses, and then it can shift all this over. And that's called a tension pneumothorax because the air is still leaking out and now air and blood. So you've got to put a chest tube in there to suck that air out to let the lung re-expand. But if you, if you let a tension pneumothorax go on and on, eventually that aorta and inferior vena cable will be so displaced that blood won't get back to the heart and a person can die. So that's what a tension pneumothorax, sometimes you see in a movie, they can't breathe and they go get a, they get a pen and they shove it in their chest and let the air out. So what do you think this is? Where do you think we are with this? Brain. It's a brain. So ventricles, brain. So this is normal. So what do you think this is? So a gun, so a bullet went through this person's head and caused all this to be disrupted. So this is all blood and destroyed brain. This is probably not survivable. So you have blood, you have swelling. So if you have blood and swelling in a closed space, just like here, it's going to shift this over, but the brain has nowhere to go. So... <laughs> What I do, huh? What's the question? Oh, Darrell's asking a question. Okay. I'm asking, like, um, so with that kind of injury, mm -hmm. they would be brain dead, right? Yes, that's what I was getting to. Exactly right. So with this, with all this, more likely than not, with all the swelling and all of that, you have a closed space. So with an ankle, it with an ankle fracture, whatever fracture, the tissues can swell, right? against the air. But here you have a closed space. So the swelling gets more and more and more until what Darrell said, you become brain dead. And what that is, is when the pressure inside the skull exceeds the pressure generated by the heart. So if your pressure here is uh, 150, 200, but your heart is only give, generating a pressure of 120, but this is 
160, 200, you're not going to get blood to your brain. Now, you might get it to your brain stem where they might be breathing still, but they're not going to have higher function. And then eventually the brain dies. And then these are the types of donors, brain dead donors that we use for um, procurements to give organs to other people. And they, this could cause from a car accident, gunshot wound, um, hanging, lots of different things, whatever cuts the blood off to the brain where the brain dies. And once it's gone, it's gone. It's not going to come back because the, the tissue dies inside of it. And it's 352. Questions? That's all I got. Um, I, uh, that last part, you said that the pressure inside our skull yeah. exceeds the exceeds. heart. Exceeds yeah. the heart. Exceeds uh, the pressure the generated heart. by the heart. Okay. So if the pressure in your skull goes up to like 200, millimeters of mercury, but your heart, your normal blood pressure is 120s, 130s, it's not going to get into your brain. And so because of that, there's, there's not going to be any blood going to the brain, the brain dies. And there's different studies that you can do. There's nuclear medicine studies where they inject the dye, a nuclear, a nuclear tracer. And on those tracers, you can see it in the heart going up the carotid arteries, and then it stops. Normally, it would go all the way into the brain, but if someone's brain, it stops usually around the ear because the blood can't, it, it can't get in there because of the pressure in that closed space. Now, what, what some neurosurgeons will do is that they'll take a part of the skull off to try to um, let the pressure down and hopefully um, allow the brain to settle down and, and not have as much swelling. But this type of injury is devastating. You, you, they may end up um, in a vegetative state if they don't go all the way and die. We also have patients who um, still have their brain stem. They can breathe some, um, but if you take them off the ventilator, it'll stop breathing. But these are the types of patients who, who have unrecoverable injuries that were, that were able to do um, to, to take their organs out, preserve them, and then give heart, lungs, kidneys, intestines, all sorts of things um, to other people who are waiting. Right now, there's probably over 120,000 people waiting for kidney transplants in the United States. And we just don't have enough donors to take care of them all. Questions? We're right on time, I guess. Perfection. Okay. No, uh, sorry, Madison has a question. What's an MRI? Oh, magnetic resonance imaging. And I, I don't have any, I didn't put any pictures of MRIs here. It's just a, it's just a different type of x-ray. And what it does, it, it, it's, it's, they can look at the hydrogen molecules inside of water and it, it gets stimulated in that. And from that, they take pictures of it. I don't know exactly how, but that, that's the basis of it. It's just a different type of, um, it's not truly x-rays per se. It, 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 they just excite the way um, they're, they're viewing the water molecules, the hydrogen inside the body to have different contrasts to see what's going on. But that's another imaging technique. Uh, Deja, do you want to ask your question? What's your favorite thing to do in your field? Uh, uh, pediatric transplants. Uh, when I have um, babies, one, two years old, who are on dialysis, to give them a kidney. That, and then people who are diabetic, to give them a pancreas as well, to cure them of their diabetes. So, so like, do you, mm -hmm. do you see like a lot of blood or and organs, like internal things? No, I, no, I keep my eyes closed. I, I can't, this stuff really <laughs> bothers me. No, no. He we try does to, not. <laughs> I do. I just do it by feel. But anyway, no, you, you try not <laughs> to have a lot of blood. Uh, you try not to have a lot of blood coming out. There, there are ways to go in and um, move things around without it bleeding. If something's bleeding, that's a problem. 
I don't like a lot of bleeding. That's a problem. If something's bleeding, that's bad. So you, the organs, uh, the blood that goes through the organs, it's contained in that and circles uh, circulates in. So if you open up somebody's belly and they're normal, you know, it's not going to be like their gush of blood. The blood isn't just um, floating around in the abdomen. It only does that if something's been broken and it's leaked out. But all of the structures, all the intestines, the liver, all of that, um, they're going to stay within those structures. And it's just the empty space otherwise. So the intestines float around in a liquid, the peritoneal fluid, they move around. So you can open someone up and move their guts around, but they, they shouldn't be bleeding unless they have a problem. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Oh, here we go. What is um, required for a diabetic to get pancreas transplant? I, I'm a type one and I've been interested in endocrinology. I'm just curious sure. what would be. Yeah, you, the, you, sure. For usually what we do are, and they've gotten a lot better now from when I started. They have a lot better um, uh, pumps now to sense um, glucose levels. They're a lot better, as I said, than I was 20 years ago when I started. But usually the folks that we deal with are people who've had such severe diabetes that they've knocked their kidneys off as well. And so we give them the pancreas um, to give insulin and they also cure, cure their kidney disease. Now, there are some people with really bad type one diabetics where the sugars are just so out of whack, they get something called hypoglycemic unawareness. That's where they take their insulin, the insulin um, knocks out their sugars, sugars get low, they can't drive, they have accidents. So there are some patients that can get kidney, get pancreas transplants for really brittle diabetics who are difficult con to control with, with the pumps and the insulin that way. So uh, as I said, the pumps are a lot better and we usually see folks who have failed all of that. Um, we also have Ashika, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, so I'm taking a nutrition course right now, and we were learning about diabetes last week. Mm -hmm. And I only, I so what I learned was that diabetes can be managed, but not completely cured. Right. And you said that the pancreas transplant gets rid of diabetes. So does that yeah. like completely, it completely leaves the patient without diabetes? It's more, yes and no. Yes, it will quote unquote cure their diabetes, but it's more of a therapy because they're now on immunosuppression for the rest of their life. So a true cure would be a way to give them the islets. People have tried to transplant the islets or, or the pancreas, but not have them take any immunosuppressive medication. Then yeah, that would be a cure. But because we are, quote, as I said, quote unquote, curing their diabetes, but they're also taking immunosuppressive drugs so they don't reject the organs. Same thing with kidney transplant. Are we curing their end stage renal disease? Yes and no. Yes, we are because now they're not on dialysis, but they have to take a lifelong uh, immunosuppression. And there's variations in that, especially like if you have an identical twin, then you can probably get away without um, immunosuppressive medication or very minimal amount because they're an exact match but the vast majority of people have to take immunosuppressive medications so they don't reject their organs. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Any other questions? I have one. Dr. Young, yep. when, you do, when you put a kidney in a person, do you have to remove tissue to have the space or you just move things around? Oh, we're just moving around. So there's a, it, it sits right in front of the hip bone. So you make an incision, go through those muscles, those oblique muscles, and just create a space. The only time we take tissue out per se is like if they have really big kidneys, those polycystic kidneys that take them out uh, to create enough space to put the kidney in because they can go all the way down into the pelvis. But we create a space and then then sew in the artery in the vein, uh, our blood in, blood out. You know, I have a, a transplant talk, but I don't think I'm scheduled for that. But um and then sew the blood in, blood out. Then I, then was something called a ureter carriage, urine from the kidney that we sew into the bladder, which is sitting right there. I don't know if I can see the picture. Oh, I don't know where that, where that PT was. 
Uh, well, I get well, sort of like this. So this this isn't in exactly the right plane, but down in here is where we would place the kidney, plug in the artery in the vein, so blood in, blood out, and then we would sew that ureter into the bladder here. So all that's right there. Years ago, they in 1933, when they didn't know how to do all this, they actually sewed the kidney into the leg and made a flap. And so the kidney didn't last that long, but the kidney was like urinating down the leg. But it didn't last long because they didn't have immunosuppressive medicine. And finally in the 1950s, um, because they used the leg because the vessels were sitting right there, but then they developed a technique to sew it um, into the iliac vessels, the, run that, the ones that run down there. Kind of lay these. The, the vessels here is where we sew it in, down here. And we leave the kidneys in um, unless they cause a problem. We don't take them out, but we sew the kidneys here. And then babies, since they're so small, I have to sew it into the aorta up here because these vessels are too small. Anything else? I don't think that's it. All right, if nobody has any other questions, we can end for the day. All right, well, thank you for your attention. And we will see you tomorrow morning for our ultrasound session. Oh, ultrasound, yay. And um, just if I can, while I've got everybody on the line, I'll probably send an announcement too, but um, we, um, we, we're we gonna have to change the schedule tomorrow for the um, iHuman Sims. Uh, that's not going to come through in time. So we'll we'll think about that this evening and see how we're going to proceed with that. So just look out for an announcement about those sessions. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. well, see good you. luck. Take care. See you tomorrow. Good evening. Bye. -bye. Have a good night. I, how do I get out of here? It doesn't Stop. say leaving.